Hebrews chapter 11 is a, is a wonderful, dense chapter. And it's, it's really a, a, a preacher's passage because it's so preachable. It's bread and butter. Hebrews chapter 11, if you've been in the church for a while, and even if you haven't heard about it, and you, you are going to love this chapter after today. Uh, chapter 11 in Hebrews, it's, it's called the Hall of Faith or the Heroes of Faith text. And the reason for that is the first two-thirds of the chapter describes all of these, these amazing heroes who trusted in the Lord through thick and thin. And, and the reason I say this is a preacher's passage is because we love these stories. I, I want to tell you just a summary of the first two-thirds of the chapter, and we're going to be in the, in the later third of this, this chapter. I want to tell you the first two-thirds of some of the stories uh, of, of faith that this chapter testifies to. I'm summarizing here in my own words, but this is, is what it says. By faith, Enoch, Enoch was taken to heaven without dying. By faith, Noah and his family were rescued, delivered, saved from the flood. By faith, Abraham received land. By faith, Abraham received a child. By faith, Abraham received a nation of descendants. Of course, we've been talking about Abraham this last month. By faith, Moses delivered Israel out of slavery, out of Egypt. By faith, Moses and the nation of Israel, they parted the Red Seas and walked through the Red Sea. By faith, Israel went into this new land. It's described as a, a land of milk and honey, a good land where things prosper. By faith, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, marched around the city of, of Jericho, and the walls came crumbling down. Again, we love these stories because it, it talks of these people who have this steadfast faith. It's a faith, it's an unwavering trust in God. And the end result that we see is this earthly blessing. Again, Abraham receives land. Moses and the, his people receive freedom from oppression. Joshua and the Israelites, they win this grand battle. And we say, oh man, look at this. Look at this. Look at the way these people trusted in the Lord, the way they had faith. And then they were blessed. They were prosperous. I, it, they're also such wonderful stories because they're applicable to us. We can tell these stories and we can say, man, look at them. Look at these, these heroes, these, these people of faith. And they had faith and were blessed. And so it's not too much of a stretch for us to preach a sermon where we then say, if you have faith, if you trust in the Lord, then you will be blessed. Then God will prosper you, just like he did Abraham, just like he did Moses. Again, this is a, a message people love to hear, and, and preachers, we love to preach it. It's a good, good message, and there's so much truth in it. Now, we could talk about this truth. We could, we could say today, if God, uh, if you have faith in God, if you trust God with your life, then he will bless you. If I trust God with my life, he's going to bless me. If all of us have faith together, if we trust him, if we just trust him through the thick and the thin, he's going to bless us. We could stop right there because we, we just had church. We, we heard these stories from Hebrews and, and, and we hear this promise that's applicable to us. And, and what is more, I, I want to read to you verse 33. 32 through verse 35. This is what it says. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and they put whole armies to flight and women received their loved ones back again from death. And if that's not a powerful text, I don't know what is. Did you hear what it said about these people who had faith? 
that they overthrew kingdoms, that they ruled with justice, that miracles happened because of their faith. Again, we could, we could stop here because we've heard the word and it's good. This is a message we love to hear. If I have faith, then God's going to bless me. This is a, a comfortable message. And it's a good message in many ways. But we can't end the sermon here because the text goes on. And I have to tell you, when I read this text, I was troubled. And Scripture has a way of doing this where it mixes up and, and rattles up what we believe to be true. And we realize that things aren't always as clean as we once thought we were, as we thought they were, but they are far messier. And so this is what the text goes on to say. In the second part of verse 35, it says this, But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were deemed too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and even holes in the ground. I want to make this clear what we just read. It says, but others, but others who were faithful, but others who trusted in God, but others who had the same faith that Abraham had, but others who had the same faith that Enoch had, but others that had the, the same faith that Moses had were tortured, were, were put to death, were sawed in two, were oppressed, were cast out, were deemed unworthy of this world. And it's not that there was something wrong with their faith. It's not that they had this sin or they, they worshipped a false god or they just couldn't get it right. No. What we just read about here in these verses, these two were people who were faithful. But look at what they received in return for their faithfulness. They were tortured. They were put to death. They were mocked. They were whipped. This doesn't sound like a life that I want to live. I don't know if it sounds like an attractive life to you, but I don't know how we make sense of this. And when I read this, I thought, God, what is it that you're, you're doing? Why is it that some people in this passage, that in, in the first two-thirds, there's all these wonderful stories about Abraham and, and these blessings that we love to talk about, of wars being won, of nations being let out of captivity, of, of children coming from people who were supposed to never be able to have a child. We love these stories. Why is it that these people were faithful and received this prosperity, this blessing, and these other people who were just as faithful did not? This is a question we have to ask. It's a worthwhile question asking. We need to ask, is it true? Is it true that if we trust God, then he will bless us. Is it true that if we trust God, then he will bless us? Because we like to make an, a, a simple mathematical formula here in the church. We like to, to say, and if I trust God, then the blessings will come. If I throw the praises up, then the blessings will come down, right? Isn't that what we say? Isn't that what we talk about in the church? All I have to do is trust God and he's going to bless me. And this text troubles me, church. <laughs> There's a reason not many people preach on the last part of Hebrews, but stick to the beginning where the blessings lie. 
So what are we to make of this? I'll tell you plainly, when I read this text, I can't get around this truth that I do see repeated many other places in in Scripture, which we're going to get into. I can't get around this truth that God does not promise us earthly prosperity in exchange for our faith. God does not promise us earthly prosperity in exchange for our faith, in exchange for our trust. What do I mean by earthly prosperity? I mean blessings here and now. The kind of blessings that Abraham received, that Moses received, that Joshua received, that many of these people received. He doesn't promise us earthly prosperity in exchange for for our trust, the mathematical formula that says, if I trust God, then he will bless me. It doesn't apply, it seems, in the kingdom of God, at least from this text. The thing is that we act as if our prosperity is conditional upon the amount of faith that we have. We act as if our prosperity is conditional upon the amount of faith and trust we have. We say, man, if, if, if I trust God, if I just pray hard enough, if I just pray hard enough, then God's going to give me that job. If, if I just pray hard enough, if I, if I just trust God and have enough faith, then he's going to give me money. And then, and then we start saying it to other people. We say, man, if you, if you just trust God, God's going to give you a husband. If, if you just trust God enough, if you just have faith and you pray, he's going to give you a wife. He's going to give you a companion. It, it, we say, if you just trust God, then he's going to give you power and influence. If you just trust God, then you would have received healing for your ailment. If you would have just trusted God more, then your loved one wouldn't have passed away. I hear this in the church. I hear terrible things like this. We say, if you would have just trusted God, then maybe you would have been able to conceive and have children if you would have just had faith. But God does not promise us earthly prosperity in exchange for our faith. And when these things don't happen, when we don't receive earthly prosperity, when we don't receive an instant fast food blessing, we say, why God? Why, God, why? I prayed so hard for healing. I prayed so hard for that job. I prayed so hard for a husband, for a wife, for a companion. I prayed so hard for influence and you didn't give it to me. And we question and we, we have pain in our soul because it seems that God hasn't held up his end of the deal. And we say, God, what are you doing? And man, if we're, if we're a, a, a Christian that puts on a good face, then we go to church and, and we say things like, man, all, all in God's timing. And we put on this facade sometimes to hide the pain that we really feel and we think, God, why aren't you showing up? Where is my blessing? Where is my blessing that you've promised me? But God does not promise us earthly prosperity in exchange for our faith. So you're thinking, Jesse, what are you doing? (laughs) Uh, I've probably just ruined some things for you, and I promise we're going somewhere with this. But I want us to sit in this and really recognize this truth. Now, I think this is a truth that is prevalent in the Scriptures. I, I love this story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that is told in the book of Daniel. And I'm going to paraphrase this here, but it's such a a, a good story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these were dudes that understood, that understood that God does not promise prosperity in exchange for our faith. So here's the story of of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Once upon a time, there's there's a guy named King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar, he loved himself. He loved himself. And he loved to be king. He loved when people would submit to him and and, and worship him and call him king and praise him. And so King Nebuchadnezzar had this great idea. One day he said, I'm going to build a statue 
that's 90 feet tall. 90 foot tall statue made of gold. And he gets, he gets together the whole orchestra. He gets together the electric guitar. He gets together the bass. He gets together the trumpet. He gets together the keys. He gets together the drummer. He gets together everyone. And he says, here's what I want you to do. Whenever I tell you to, it could be every day. It could be twice a day. It could be five times a day. It could be once a week. Whenever I tell you to, orchestra, band, I want you to play music. And, and, and before you play music, I want to make sure you go throughout the whole city and you tell people when you hear music, worship the statue, bow down, fall prostrate on the ground and, and worship this statue because King Nebuchadnezzar is your God. He is your king. You submit to him. You answer to him. And make sure the people know this, that when they hear the music that they have to worship. And so... Here's the, the, the band, and they strike up, and they play their song. And, you know, people, people do the thing because they don't want to stir the pot too much. They're thinking, man, I just want to go on, live my life. And so most people worship, and they bow down. And, and one day, uh, one, of the, one of the king's officials, they, they spot these three guys when the music is playing. And uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are their names. And they don't bow down to the king. And they tell him, they say, we're not going to bow down to the king. It, they, the officials go and tell King Nebuchadnezzar about this. They say, hey, you know there's three guys? These three dudes, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they won't bow down to you. They don't worship when the song plays. They don't bow down to your statue. They're, they worship some other god, some Elohim, some Jehovah, some god of Abraham. I don't know who that is, but they worship another god. So King Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, call them into my courts. So he calls Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego right there into his courts. And he says, you guys know, do you understand that I can throw you into a furnace and you can burn for this? Do you understand what you're doing? Do you understand the consequences? So I'll give you one more chance. You can, you can bow down and worship me, pledge your allegiance to me, and I'll save you. I'll spare your life. But man, if you don't bow down, you're going straight into the flames. And you know what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say? I love this. They say, they say, our God will rescue us from the flames. And then this is a part I love. They say, but even if he doesn't, but even if he doesn't, we still won't worship you. We still won't bow down. Even if he doesn't, even if he lets our bodies be consumed and burned by the flames, we still won't bow down and worship you. They said, we know that God doesn't have to save us to still be God, to still be faithful, to still be good. I love that. And in this instant, man, man God rescues them. And it's, it's an awesome story. We love it. We love this story. I want to talk about a different hero of faith in the Bible. Jeremiah. Jeremiah the prophet. Man, Jeremiah had a hard job. You know what Jeremiah's job was? He had to go preach to people who wouldn't listen to him. <laughs> now, if you're a preacher out there, you're thinking, yeah, that's a bad job. Now, Jeremiah, he went to people, and, and this is what the Lord said to him. God said, Jeremiah, I'm calling you to a people who won't listen to a hard-hearted people. I'm calling you to a people who will oppress you, who will hate you, who will put you down, who will listen to your message and scoff at you, who will abandon you, who will turn you away because of your message. Jeremiah, this is what I'm calling you to. And Jeremiah said he had to preach because the word of God was like fire in his bones and he was faithful to God. He preached the word to these people. And what did he get in return? Nothing. There was no earthly prosperity in Jeremiah's life because of his faithfulness and trust in the Lord. Now I think of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, man, he was put in prison and he was beheaded and Jesus calls him great in the kingdom of heaven. He played a crucial role in the ministry of Jesus and he's beheaded. We could go on and on about these heroes of faith, these people who trusted in the Lord but did not receive 
an earthly blessing. So what's the point of trusting in God? What is the point of trusting in God? For this, we have to continue on in Hebrews. Because I believe that God has promised to bless those who trust in Him. But it is a different blessing. And I would say that it is a better blessing, that God has promised a better blessing to those who trust in Him, to those who are faithful in God has promised a better blessing to those who trust in him. Here's what verse uh, 39 through 40 says in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, and yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection Without us. So let's, let's break this down here. It says, all these people. Who are all these people? All these people, it's referring to all these people in Hebrews chapter 11. In other words, those who received blessing, meaning Abraham, Noah, Enoch, all these people who, who conquered and did these great things through faith, and all these people who suffered. All these people, those who received both blessing and suffering. It says, they earned a good reputation, which a, a, a maybe better translation of this is they were justified. They were made righteous. They were saved. They were born again. They were, they were righteous in the eyes of God because of their faith. And yet none of them received what God had promised or all that God had promised. So we have to ask, what is it that God had promised? Because if Abraham and Moses and these people who seemed to receive blessing actually didn't receive what God had promised, then what is it that God has promised? And then it goes on to say, for God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. There's another verse here that's tucked in, uh, verse 35, the last part of it. It's referring to those who suffered for their faith. And it says this, they place their hope in a better life after the resurrection. They place their hope in a better life after the resurrection. So what is it that God has promised? God has promised a life after the resurrection, a life that will come once this world is done and over. It says that, uh, that God will make things perfect. It, verse 40, again, for God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. So a life after the resurrection and perfection this is what he's promised. God has promised for those who trust in him, perfection. God has promised for those who trust in him, completion, an end to this story that we live in, an end to the toil. This is what Revelation 21, one through seven says. I, I can't describe this, what, what God has promised any better than this. Revelation 21, one through seven says this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is, this is a vision here of Revelation. For the, first city, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Listen to this. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. 
I will be their God and they will be my children. There will come a day when God makes all things perfect. When God makes all things perfect. What does perfect mean? And there will be a day when there will be no more death. There will come a day when there will be no more sickness. There will come a day when there will be no more division. There will come a day when there will be no more racism. There will come a day when there will be no more social inequality. There will come a day when there is peace, when there is no more war. There will come a day when we will love one another as Christ loved one another. There will come a day when we get to be with Jesus himself. There will come a day when all of creation is redeemed. There will come a day when there is no more pollution. There will come a day when all things are just made perfect. Perfect. And church, this is what God has promised. And that's why it says all these people have not yet received all that God had promised. Yes, some of them received blessing and some of them received trial. But you know what? Their lives, their lives here on earth, just like your life and just like my life, were specks on the timeline of eternity. Our lives, man, when we get to heaven, one day when we say, man, God, we've, we've trusted in him and we get to heaven and we look around, we're going to realize we have, we have all of time in front of us and our time here on earth was a speck on the timeline of all of eternity. And so these people had not yet received what God had promised because God had promised to make all things perfect. Jesus understood the power of this future blessing. He understood how powerful this promise from God really was. And I say this because I think of him when he was facing death in the garden of Gethsemane. He's there and he's facing death. He's in agony. It, it, some texts say, uh, in Luke it even says that he's sweating blood. Uh, what we know now is a physiological sign of extreme stress. He's there in the, the garden and he's, he's ready to go to the cross. And he's in agony and he, he says, Father, take this cup from me. Take this cup of suffering. Take this burden of going to the cross away from me. But not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. He submits to God. He says, man, I'll, I'll be faithful to you if it entails suffering. And we know that the Father did not take the cup of suffering from Jesus, but allowed him to suffer crucifixion, a brutal death. So how did Jesus endure how did Jesus endure this intense suffering? This is what Hebrews 12 says, and this is right after what we just read in Hebrews 11. It's, it's Hebrews 12, verse 2, the second part of verse 2. It says this of Jesus, because of the joy set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Because of the joy set before him, Jesus endured because of the joy, because of the promise that was yet to come, because he knew that ahead of him was perfection because of his death and resurrection on the cross, there would be perfection. And because of his death and resurrection on the cross, man, there is life for us. There is perfection ahead of us if we would just trust him, if we would put our faith in him, follow him, that's a good, good thing. So I want us to ask ourselves this question. Is our faith conditional upon God blessing me here and now? Is my faith 
dependent on God blessing me here and now? Is my trust conditional upon God blessing me here and now? Do I need God to give me health and wealth and prosperity for him to keep me going? And if that's true, I think God wants to do something in your heart today and in all of our lives today. I believe that he wants to build in us an unconditional trust. A trust that does not depend on blessings to continue to trust in him. Just like Jeremiah, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just like John the Baptist, just like Jesus himself. And they didn't say, God, you need to bless me for me to keep going. They said, no, I trust in you because you're good. And I trust that you have something better coming. I trust that you will make all things perfect. So church, I pray that you would trust more deeply in him because of who he is and because of what he has done for us.